Good morning. Welcome to this event at Hudson Institute. Thank you all for joining us in person and for those of you who are watching online. Uh, my name is Rebecca Heinrichs. I'm a senior fellow here at Hudson, and I'm also the director of our Keystone Defense Initiative. I am privileged to have with me today Senator Mike Rounds. Senator Mike Rounds um, was sworn into the United States Senate on January 6, 2015. The senator serves on five committees, armed services, banking, housing and urban affairs, Indian affairs, veterans affairs, and select committee on intelligence. He is uh, really qualified to speak to us today on the topic of our conversation, which is the B-21 Raider. And uh, Hudson, I just uh, conducted a study on the B-21, and several experts across the think tank world contributed their analysis on what the B-21 Raider will be able to provide the country its various characteristics and attributes, especially in the two power, uh, two nuclear peer power problem. And so today we're gonna talk about the B-21. And Senator, we're so happy to have you here. If you wouldn't mind just providing a few opening remarks about how you see the threat, um, to the extent that you can talk about it, and then we'll get into the B-21. Great, thank you, appreciate the opportunity. Let me begin with a, with a broader brush of what I see happening right now and what we're going to see over the next several decades. It used to be that we fought um, in the air, on the land, in and under the sea. Now we add to that cyber and space as, <clears throat> as additional domains. So when you add all of that up together, you have to be able to win in every single domain. We're working really hard to maintain and to be competitive with two near peer competitors, both Russia and China. We should never, ever count out Russia. They are nuclear capable. They have very good cyber capabilities and very good space capabilities. Uh, China has developed very rapidly their space capabilities, their cyber capabilities. They have perhaps the largest uh, land-based uh, missile system in the world and uh, they continue to grow it. They have a very strong nuclear capability as well. Uh, today, in the United States, we have always, at least most recently, we have been focused on being able to deter an, an opponent. Now we have two separate opponents that we have to deter at the same time. If you were either one of those two uh, opponents, Russia or China, and if the United States was entering into a conflict with the other, there is no reason that, that the, there wouldn't be at least a consideration of taking advantage of our attention being placed someplace else. We have to assume that if we have a problem with one of those two near-peer competitors, we will also have a problem with the other at basically the same time. The B-21 fits into this because you have to have a nuclear-capable system that can enter into and hold them at risk inside their homeland. That gets their attention. Today, we have space-based capabilities to be able to see, but in the time of a conflict, that's probably gonna go away. The same as we would try to take away their capabilities. Cyber, there is not gonna be a cyber attack, there is not going to be a conflict in the future without first having a cyber warning in, the, in, in basically the, the impact of a cyber attack on us we will be doing the same to either one of those adversaries as well. Then you get back down to what do you actually have for a hammer? What do you actually have that reaches out? Today we have old B-51s. Um, we have B-1s that are worn out. Uh, we have 20 B-2s that were developed in the 1980s. At some stage of the game, Xi Jinping or Mr. Putin, either one, are gonna look at this and say, do they really have the capabilities or are they a paper tiger? Do we really have to fear these weapon systems or have our capabilities to respond to those offensive capabilities? Are the defensive capabilities that have been built by both Russia and China, are they capable of withstanding an attack by us? Um, should we actually, and, and I think from their perspective, they're gonna question should this actually deter us from moving forward with our long-term goals? When the B-21 enters the picture, this whole, this whole scenario changes. B-21 is uh, an aircraft that has been designed to be the most stealthy that the world has ever seen. 
They do not have today the defensive capabilities to defend against it. It has long range capabilities, which starts to take care of the problem that we have in the Pacific and that today we don't have the ability necessarily to get all the way into China with our most advanced weapon systems and to take out some of their critical infrastructure, their defensive capabilities and their offensive capabilities. With the advent of the B-21, they have long range to begin with. They have the ability to be refueled. They have the ability to loiter in the area and the ability to carry not just uh, nuclear weapons, but also uh, conventional weapons as well. This is a marvelous game changer for the United States. Today, we're talking about purchasing 100 of them. That's a down payment only. Uh, there is no way that we can look at challenging or at least um, being able to deter both Russia and China unless we substantially increase the number of B-21s that we're looking at purchasing. Now, I like the idea that we start with 100. During that time period, Northrop Grumman and the other uh, contractors will be refining their ability to actually create these on a more rapid basis, a streamlined basis, as efficiently as possible. Each tranche will allow uh, for the development of new capabilities to be included and new weapon systems to be added to this badass weapon of both war and peace. Our goal is peace, but in order to achieve that peace, we have to have a hammer that basically says don't mess with us. And that if you do, the consequences are severe. As long as both China and Russia recognize that we do have that capability and that they do not have the, the, the capability to defend against it, it really makes them think twice about some of their more aggressive postures that otherwise they will continue to pursue. For our allies, the fact that we have a B-21 which is coming online that can loiter, that can be in place, that can move across the Pacific fairly rapidly, um, and can, can reach both Russia and China, that gives our allies more confidence that we really are in this and that we are an ally that they can, that they can rely on. That, I think, in, in essence, is, 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 is a major part of the reason why I am a very strong supporter for the continued development of the B-21 program. But let me just finish with one other thought. We are $33 trillion in debt. The cost to our country right now, with the additional costs that are just for the cost of, of, of financing that debt going up, to the point where we are very close in just interest payments on the debt being equal to or very close to what we are actually paying for our defensive uh, uh, protections right now, that's going to get worse before it gets better. But in the meantime, as we start talking about being in debt by trillions of dollars, perhaps the most expensive thing that could ever happen to us, one of the most expensive things that could ever happen to us, is if we actually had to fight a war instead of deterring a war. The most expensive thing that we should try to avoid is losing a war. So in that order, the least expensive of all of those options is to prepare in advance for what is a likely out or a likely scenario, which would be a confrontation with two near peer competitors. The most important hammer that we have to develop is the B-21. Let's get that on board. Let's get it deployed. Let's get it set up for all of the different options that it can be used for, and then move forward with doing everything else we can to deter the possibility of actually enter, entering into a war, but if it does happen, to be able to win the war and not lose the war. Senator, thank you so much. And, and actually, I'm, I served as one of the congressionally appointed commissioners on the Bipartisan Strategic Posture Commission, and we just finished and produced our report, and one of our findings and recommendations was exactly what you just said, which is that we're going to need more B-21s for the two nuclear peer challenge to be able to deter both of those countries simultaneously. And so uh, very much your comments resonate with me very much. And there is bipartisan consensus on that point and appreciate your leadership, sir. If I can just get back to a really important point you made about 
uh, of the Russia problem and that Russia still it poses a challenge for the United States. It's a serious nuclear threat. So even as we get this news about how well Ukrainians have done at degrading the Russian military in Ukraine, that Russia still poses a, a, an acute serious problem for the United States because it still is determined to, to undo the U.S. system of alliances in Europe and abroad. Can you, anything else you can expand on that and how that relates to Ukraine? Um, because I think it's an important piece of the puzzle as we think about deterrence. No, you, you, you're right. Look, let's never forget about Russia. Um, first of all, they have lots of people. They can bring up lots of people to actually go to war. Second of all, they have manufacturing capabilities that they are just beginning to once again tap with regard to creating the conventional weapon systems that they're losing in Ukraine right now. So this giant, and it is a giant of a country, uh, they have been reawakened and, and they will begin the process of rebuilding their conventional forces. They learned how lousy their army was. They learned how lousy their air force was. The corruption, uh, the, the, the inability to maintain it and so forth, that hit them hard. They're not gonna make that mistake again. They're gonna come back into it and they're gonna start rebuilding. They will not have the technical capabilities that we necessarily have, but they're gonna come very, very close. With regard to nuclear capabilities, they are a nuclear weapons system. They have advanced nuclear weapons. Uh, they, uh, they, uh, they have uh, a, a leadership team that has seriously considered the use of tactical nuclear weapons as a way to deter in, the, in, in, in Europe. And uh, look, they're, they're, of all the folks out there, they would be probably, in my opinion, the first to actually use a tactical nuclear weapon, other than the rogue states of, of Iran and North Korea. But uh, uh, Russia should not be discounted. They do have a good background in science and technology and they will continue to develop advanced systems as we do. And in space, they are very capable yet. They have resources in space. And while, and while China is continuing to develop and is moving quickly beyond what Russia has for technical capabilities today, we should never forget that Russia has very good technical capabilities. And with Putin at the helm, um, they are still an aggressor state. Yeah, exactly. And then last point on that, on Russia, too. Um, then there seems to be two views, everything you just said um, so well, about it being a serious nuclear power. You know, outnumber U.S. nuclear, short, those shorter-range nuclear uh, deployment systems 10 to 1, sort of, as the unclassified and reported assessments. And that's been outside the New START Treaty. Now they're not um, abiding by the New START Treaty's accounting requirements. And so there, there is this narrative, though, that then because of all those things that the United States should stop its support to Ukraine because it isn't worth it. You know, my, my, my assessment has been, and I can, you can just not to lead the witness, but then you can agree or disagree, that it's sort of you're seeing it it's out of the wrong, the wrong way, that Admiral Richard, the previous STRATCOM commander, said, this is a small one we got to get right. Because if we don't, there's a bigger one coming, essentially paraphrasing him. Is that your assessment, that, that, that support for Ukraine um, and helping Ukraine end this war on terms favorable to Ukraine is related to that calculation for the Russians? It's related to a little bit bigger picture than that even, because it's not just a matter of making Russia think that, you know, look, it's bigger than just the United States. This is the entire NATO group. And what Putin has done has successfully increased the size and the intensity of NATO's opposition to what Russia has been doing. Uh, they now once again have been reinforced in their belief that Russia is the threat. And so now you have countries who have been, been more involved or, or looking more at their economic development and their societal issues. And now they're refocused once again on what is a real existential threat to a number of their smaller countries in and around Russia. So you have reinvigorated a NATO. NATO cannot allow Ukraine to be simply swept up by an aggressive Putin. So now in, in Ukraine, you find freedom-loving individuals who love their country, who want the independence of a country, who want to join the free world. They want to become a part of the European Union. Now they have to have their country redeveloped. But to allow them now to slip back in and to be dominated by Russia works in, in the authoritarians benefit. Um, the other piece of this 
is that we have substantially deteriorated the Russian war machine that they thought would work. And anything that we can do to degrade their confidence in their ability to actually invade another country will deter them for an extended period of time while NATO rebuilds its capabilities. But the other piece on this that sometimes we talk about and sometimes we get past is that it's not just Putin as an authoritarian who is looking at this. It's also Xi Jinping. And I think Xi Jinping is a very bright guy. And I think he is looking at this saying, what is my cost when I want to bring back in Taiwan, which he has decided is part of his long-term plans. Can I get away with it? Can I get in and can I take out Taiwan? And do, the, do these other people, do these other countries out there really care enough about Taiwan to actually help them resist? I think what he's going to see is, is number one, the Taiwanese identify not so much as Chinese, but as Taiwanese. The second piece on that is, is I think they need the confidence to know that the rest of the free world does not like the idea of authoritarian countries stepping in and deciding that they simply want to take over the land or, or, or the assets of one of their neighbors. That is not the way that you keep peace in the world. And so in each of these cases where Xi Jinping looks at whether or not the allies can stick together, if he finds chinks in the armor, if he finds that we can only focus on this for 30 days or for 90 days or for 180 days, then he can wait us out. And that starts to make him think that perhaps he can get away with this and the cost is not so great. What Xi Jinping has to measure in is, is what is my cost at home? Do I save face or do I lose face if I say I can take back Taiwan and instead the entire country sees this as a failure? or perhaps that Taiwan sees themselves as a true country uh, or as something affiliated with and with Chinese ancestry suddenly being attacked by mainland China, communist China. What does that do to his ability to be the great leader that he wants to be remembered as? Mm -hmm. That's great. And, and to your point too, there's other Asian democratic allies who have generally made the same <clears throat> assessment you just made. They're looking at Ukraine. That's why you have South Korea contributing munitions yeah. as well to Ukraine. Yeah, look, th this is where the B-21 really comes in. Um, it has long range. It has the legs to be able to get over the Pacific uh, 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 Ocean. One of the challenges we have is just distance, just a huge distance in, in the Pacific. And when you start talking about where you can actually base your resources to respond to uh, either an invasion or a blockade of, of uh, Taiwan, um, it, you've got to recognize just the distances that we're talking about. Now, we've only got a few aircraft right now that can meet those distances. You bring aircraft carriers in, you put them at risk, and you put you know, as many as 5,000 Americans in, at risk at a time. China has been watching the way that we fight, and they know that what we do is, is we build up our teams. We build a huge amount of mass together, and then we go in and, and, and basically we come in and, and uh, you know, we have the resources available close by. We protect those resources. And then we go in and we take out the enemy's uh, uh, defenses. We take out their command and control. And uh, then we start working on the individual offensive capabilities that, a, that, a, that an adversary has. They know that. They watched what we did in 1991. Um, they've seen what we did uh, in, in, a, in, a Iran, or in Iraq. Uh, they understand our way of fighting, and they have tried to model it and to defend against that now. While we've been fighting terrorism, they've been trying to figure out how they can win against our best. Mm. So they want to push us away from those island chains that we could have bases on. They want to push our carriers out to the point where our carrier aircraft can't get in and actually help protect um, the straits in and around Taiwan. What they can't defend against is a long-range bomber that they can't see. And for at least several decades, the capabilities under the B-21 are gonna be such that their best defensive systems can't see it. Now we're gonna be able to continue because of the way that we're developing the B-21 to do plug and play. As we develop new capabilities and we see offensive capabilities coming from China and Russia, we can actually take out older systems and replace them with newer systems to further defend the B-21 from discovery and uh, to defend against the, the attacks coming. So 
Movie 21 is going to be here. It's going to be here for 50 years. And during that time period, it will be used not just for the delivery of, of traditional bombs, but for standoff weapons as well, and eventually weapon systems that have yet to be developed. And in this, a of in this era of artificial intelligence, we will be using this particular platform to direct more and more of our conventional capabilities as we take out the defensive capabilities of the enemy and make it easier for our conventional forces to get in. We also have the ability to direct them using the B-21 kind of as a, as a quarterback. Very similar to what we can with the F-35 and the F-22 in the shorter range areas, B-21 will have the same types of capabilities. Glad you brought that up. It's the court that's it's been called sort of a has a quarterbacking capability. So, yeah. and that can be it can quarterback unmanned systems. And so there's other things that we can plug into the architecture to be able to really give it its own um, combat power it, if deterrence does fail. And then the next part of the mission is to, to win. And, and in fact, the B 21 is being built in such a fashion that eventually it will be able to do missions without being manned. And that's a part of the long-term planning on the B-21 today. 100 units, it's correct to start out to get everything done and get it operational. But look, we're, we're talking, and I, I know that some of your experts have actually recommended over 280 units when we're all said and done. It's not unreasonable when you're looking at both Russia and China and knowing that you have to have both conventionally capable weapon systems and nuclear capable weapon systems to have enough to make sure that they realize that it's going to be an extremely expensive uh, attack by them because they will not be able to defend against the counterattack by B-21s. Right, and that, and that number comes from I mean, how, how we think about deterrence is, because um, fundamentally, as you said, it, this, is, this is the air leg of the nuclear triad. So first, its first role is to, is to prevent the war from happening to begin with. And when we think about deterring nuclear powers, the United States really since the 70s have, have thought about what do we have to hold at risk? And it's that those things that which the authoritarian regime values most. And so we know what those categories are. And so now if we're going to, now we've been thinking really since 2009, we've really only looked at Russia as the major nuclear power and that China as a lesser threat. And that was the Obama administration. It really was the Bush administration, the Obama administration. Well, we're in a new problem. We have now these two. Well, that just means that the deterrent requirements, that just the numbers have grown. And therefore, you're going to have to have the air leg to be able to reach out and convince the adversary that we can, we can put a weapon system, we can put a weapon on each of those targets. And you're not going to get away with it just because it's deeply buried inside mainland China. That, that, that's correct. Look, we've got conventional capabilities to be able to go very deep. But we also have nuclear capabilities as well. This bomber can be used in both capabilities, in, in, in both possibilities. Something else as well. For a period of time now, we've been focused on terrorism and, and really threats that where we can dominate both in space and in, in the air. When we start talking about both Russia and China, that becomes a challenge once again. Our space-based capabilities will be at risk. Um, they are very good at it. They've already proven that they can take out satellite systems. They have satellite systems. We have to have a weapon system that can survive without having those space-based capabilities. Um, the B-21 is designed to be able to do that as well. And so once again, one more opportunity to deter if they think that we need space-based capabilities in order to respond to an aggressive action on their part, and if they can take those out, which they'll do their best to do, um, we still have the ability to be able to respond using B-21s because we recognize that the space-based assets may not be available when we need them. The other important element, I think, of the B B-21 in this era is we have some nervous, understandably nervous allies. We do. Uh, they're, they're, they're the ones that are going to be much closer. They're really closer into where it's going to begin as a regional conflict, um, you know, as we think this through. And so they want also increased assurances from the United States. And, and the B-21 plays a role in assuring our allies because of its ability to, you know, to be, to be deployed and be recalled. Um, but, but also, so I'm thinking about South Korea. I'm even thinking about the Australians in the AUKUS context. It seems to me that there is, and this was some of the assessments in the report, 
that there's opportunities here to, to, to collaborate with allies in, in the mission of the B-21, whether it's refueling or basing. Um, have you thought that, about at, that, sir? At, look, at, at our, our planners have. And, and, I, and I'm pleased to say that, that that's one of the reasons why our relationship with Australia is so critical. It's the reason why we have a good working relationship with South Korea, who clearly wants us to be very active in their part of the world. Look, they, they see the Americans as being um, uh, the, the century. Um, we're the folks that if we're there, China thinks twice about whether or not they want to attack. China does not want to have a war with the United States, but at the same time, they want to be aggressive to their neighbors. If they think that they can be aggressive enough and if the United States is, is, is distracted, then, then it works to their advantage. And our allies want to be assured that we're not going to be distracted and that we will have the resources to be able to, to defend uh, and to deter both in Europe and in Asia. Mm -hmm. And we've got, you know, you look, 50% of all the trade in the world, probably closer to 60% of all the trade in the world goes through those trades in and around Malaysia. You have to have the ability, if you want to have a long-term economy in the United States, you have to have the ability to assure those folks that we will have free trade in the world. Yeah. China would like to change that scenario. They believe that they've been disrespected. Um, they believe that they should control that part of the world and that we should bow to them. I think most of the rest of the world would prefer to have free trade. They'd prefer to be able to move freely about and that the oceans should be free to, to transport. Um, we want to see the economies in all countries grow. We want to see quality of life for countries improve. China, on the other hand, would like to see other countries subservient to them in the region. They believe they've been disrespected and that creates a problem for the rest of us. Because until such time as we can reassure them that they are welcome back in to a free world, and until such time as Xi Jinping sees the opportunity to actually open up trade with other countries and to be a trusted partner, uh, we're gonna have this problem and we're gonna have to have the deterrence, not just for Russia, but for China as well. Once again, B-21 fits that. The B-21 is the hammer, the real hammer that comes down. We can talk about cyber, we can talk about space. We can talk about submarines. But the reality is that bomber, that ability to get inside and to take out defensive capabilities and open up for conventional attacks or nuclear attacks, that truly is the hammer of deterrence. It, it, is, it is one of the best ways that we can keep peace in the world is to make sure that our adversaries know that we can reach out and touch them. Mm -hmm. That is the B-21. And, and you make an important point about how the United States is really the one seeking to defend the status quo. So we are not the ones that are trying to uh, create something different in Asia where the Chinese may be reacting to something that's provocative. It's that the Chinese are the ones that are seeking to uh, supplant the United States and to create a, an environment where they are the ones that are deciding the rules, so to speak. That's correct. And, and look, it, it, it is a different axis of, of power. Yeah. They would love to have uh, you know, their, their currency be the currency of the world. Today, it's the United States, so it's the dollar. The reason, because we have the stability, but we have the economy. Um, our allies want to be able to participate in the economic development of their own countries. They want to have free trade. They recognize, look, our allies recognize copyrights. They recognize patents. They recognize intellectual property. China has a problem with that because in many ways in their society, as one of their ambassadors told me over dinner one time, in our culture, which is 5,000 years old, we really don't recognize how a person can own an idea. Hmm. That's a difference because we see that as economic development to allow someone to come up with an idea, to develop an idea, and then to be, be compensated for the idea and to protect that person's interest. That's the reason why artificial intelligence is going to develop more in the United States than elsewhere because those new ideas, those capabilities can be protected here. It's the reason why we have to continue to develop those new, those new resources and those new technologies. Um, yeah, China's going to be our adversary. But long term, perhaps, with either a change in leadership on their part 
or perhaps a reconsideration on the part of their leadership, they can join the rest of the free world. Hmm. And that would be great. And at that stage of the game, um, the, the purpose for the B-21 will have been fulfilled, which will be peace. Yeah. On the other hand, if China is um, serious about their aggressive approach, B-21 may very well be the hammer that uh, allows us to win a war rather than to lose a war. And once again, the most inexpensive is to be prepared for a war that never happens. The second is to win a war. The worst would be to lose the war. Mm. And, and, and the, our Japanese allies, South Koreans, Australians, they, Taiwan, um, they, want a, they want a world in which the United States is the preeminent power. For all the reasons no you question. just said. It, look, look you, you hit it on the head. You, you think sometimes, do they really want us in the middle of this? And do they really want it? And the answer is, is absolutely yes. Our allies come to us, NATO allies come and say, look, you have to take the lead. You have to be the leader of the free world. You're the only one that have the economy. You have the capabilities. If you don't do it, somebody else will fill that void. And so for time and time again, whether we're meeting with our NATO allies or our friends in, in, in the Pacific Rim region, the message is consistent. They want our attention. Even in Africa, which is a place where we are not good at respecting a number of those leaders over there who really are the George Washingtons in their own, in their own countries today as they try to create small democracies and so forth. We have a tendency to look down and to tell them that they're not meeting our social goals. But those same people tell us that they want our attention. They would much rather do trade with us than with China. They'd much rather have our investments than Chinese investments. They see the difference between an authoritarian, an authoritarian approach or that of a democracy where you have messy discussions and so forth, but you do it for the good of the people rather than for the good of the leadership. And uh, we should never forget that we do truly have a place in the world. And I, that's not a new thing. That, that did not begin with Ronald Reagan. That goes over all the way back to a guy by the name of George Washington who clearly saw the ability to talk about man, men as a, as a brotherhood who should be working for the improvement and the quality of life for all mankind. Senator, do you think that South Dakotans understand this? Yes, I do. I, I, look, we're, we're going to be the home of the B-21 bomber. We're, we're the first, the Ellsworth Air Force Base, which is near Rapid City, South Dakota, in the Black Hills. Uh, it's the home of the B-1 right now. Uh, it, it has been the home of the B-52 bombers in the past. Um, Ellsworth Air Force Base is looking forward to welcoming the first two squadrons and then perhaps the ninth squadron as well. But the first one's a training squadron for the B-21. Uh, we're developing the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the actual facilities for that right now. Uh, the second squadron that's coming in will be the first operational squadron for the B-21. And then uh, from there, both uh, 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 Whiteman and, uh, and Dias are both also being included in this. And uh, then we come back with the ninth one to be back in, uh, in South Dakota. We will also have to, as we increase the total numbers, we'll have seriously consider other air bases as well for bases to sp spread that out over a number of different locations for the B-21 bed now. Wonderful. I think we've got some time for questions from the audience. If you can just state your name um, uh, and then go ahead and ask a brief question. Go ahead, sir. And My welcome. name is Hello. There you go. <laughs> okay. Uh, between you and design to deter the China and Russia mainly, how about the North Korea? So in terms of the extent it's run to U.S. provide to South Korea, so how do you see that between you and impact it extended to South Korea? Yeah, we, we recognize that North Korea is a threat. We, we consider them to be a rogue nation because literally they have a leader who may or may not, uh, for his, his own purposes, be aggressive. The B-21 most certainly has the ability to penetrate any of the defenses that North Korea has. We know where they keep their systems. We, you know, it's not a, not a secret to us as to where they keep their, their uh, weapon systems at. We know what they have for weapon systems. Uh, we also know how we can take out their weapon systems. And you need a stealth aircraft in order to be able to do that. The B-21 fills that 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 role. So do you agree that the US deployed to Ukraine in a bomb area because of the 
the nice thing about the B21 is that it has the ability to span great distances. Um, it is not supersonic, uh, but it can move in a period of hours, even from the continental United States in. As we add more B-21s, there will be a rotation, just like there is today among our other aircraft. The B-2 will be rotated through Guam at this time as well. You will see the same types of rotations and visits to our allies as well. And it's nice to be able to have them have the same impression of this weapon system, this platform, as many of you might have seen in the opening when it was first introduced to the world as the B-21, uh, as we just brought it out of the hangar for a little bit and then took it back in. And so we part of, part of being able to show deterrence is to allow the rest of the world to actually see that this is a real weapons platform with real capabilities. Great. Ma'am? You can just state your name and then, oh, well, oh sorry, it's going to, Dan, behind you. <laughs> Dan, you're next. <laughs> Thank you. Dr. Myrtle Alexander, Institute for Academic Management. Thank you so much for your detailed presentation this morning. I really appreciate it. My question to you as a former Army wife speaks to the manufacturing of the B-21. Right now, I believe the location is California. Is there any plan to distribute it, the manufacturing across the United States? And then also, how can you speak to the status of the workforce that is capable, skilled, to be able to do that, and also a timeline that we anticipate having the, um, I think, the pilot just last month? Can we anticipate when the first 10, the first 50, first 100 will be readily available? Let me, I, I'm going to be very careful about speaking on behalf of the Air Force with regard to deployment. Um, let me say that with regard to workforce, uh, as of this last, this last month, um, Northrop Grumman, who is the primary, says they have the workforce. I do not know of any plans to develop a second uh, formation location, but the, the other contractors, and there are lots and lots of subcontractors, are across the entire United States. So the subcontracting will continue to be done elsewhere, but um, you have, uh, you have, I don't know if I can talk about where the other locations are at for this, but there's, there's, uh, there are other major suppliers of different components to the B-21 that are not just in California, but are located in other facilities across the United States. Um, with regard to the, to the timing on this, the Air Force will simply say that the first deliveries will be in the middle part of this decade. And I think that's where I will leave it as well. Can you speak to the, um, the health of the Homestead Air Force Base? And are they the, a factor the, the in health this of the what? Homestead Air Force Base? And are they a factor in? I'm not sure. No, no. I, I, oh. I, I, the, the three that are, that are part of the process right now will be Ellsworth, mm. uh, Dias, and, uh, and Whiteman. Whiteman. OK, thank you so much. Great questions. Thank yeah. you so much for being here. Dan? Hi, uh, Dan McEvergan from Hudson. And thank you for joining us today, Senator. Um, last month, um, Putin gave a tel televised speech where he called on greater collaboration with China on defense um, cutting edge technology. Um, given that, and given the, uh, the, the China's help with uh, some of the dual use equipment in Ukraine, um, where do you see the Russia-China relationship evolving, particularly on the technical side in the years ahead? Yeah, I think there's been a change. I think for a while Putin was the big brother, and I think now he's found himself because of his economic woes and because of, uh, uh, of the battle that he has going on in Ukraine right now, he's basically beholden to China to, to help him. And I think China is taking advantage of that opportunity. Um, I think Russia will be expected to pay for what uh, China delivers to them in terms of munitions and so forth. Um, it means that, uh, that that relationship between Xi Jinping and Putin has now reversed, and that Xi Jinping is now the dominant of the two. Um, I think uh, Putin is discovering that uh, the technologies that China has are in some cases equal to or better than what Russia had. And uh, with regard to cyber capabilities, 
um, China continues to develop at a more rapid pace than what Russia does today. Uh, both are a threat to the United States every single day. Um, I think that, that it speaks to the fact that, that China desperately needs to find allies, and they can't find them in the free world. What you now have is, is truly an, an axis made up of China and Russia, North Korea and Iran, um, and, and they are actively engaged in communications among themselves. But then you have the rest of the world who is looking at freedom and who wants to be free, and they see these four countries as a greater threat uh, to their own long-term freedom than, than clearly than they see in the United States. There may be others around the world who see our economic power and would love to have that themselves, but none of them that I can see or that I have visited with seem to have an interest in developing uh, unilateral arrangements with just Russia or with China. A lot of those countries out there would love to live in peace, and they'd love to have good relations with everybody. I understand that. But they also recognize that there is a cost to having a relationship with either Russia or China that many of them don't want to pay. And to your previous point, sir, and they want the United States to be the leader in the coalescing. No question about that. that. Okay. Yeah, no question. Well, I think I'm going to end end this wonderful discussion um, by reading just a little section from one of the essays in a report. And I do encourage you all to go to Hudson's website and download this, uh, what I think is going to be a really helpful uh, report that, that Hudson has led with various contributors across the think tank world. But I think this really kind of ties our whole conversation together. It's from Mackenzie Eaglin from um, AEI wrote this essay. And she was talking about the acquisition program of the B-21, where people in, in 2015, whenever it was first um, uh, inked, the, the deal for the B-21, people were skeptical that our Pentagon could do this so quickly. Yet despite, McKenzie says, the initial unease, the development of the B-21 has drawn bipartisan praise as a success story. It has been lauded by Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin as, quote, a testament to America's enduring advantages in ingenuity and innovation, end quote, which is something the senator, I think, it's almost, it has this symbolic weight to it that as these authoritarian countries are collaborating to supplant the United States, we were, actually, we were able, because of our ingenuity and our free market um, economy, we were able to produce this. And then McKinsey goes on and quotes Senator Mike Rounds uh -oh. and says um, that, had, that he had that emphasized the B-21 could one day emerge as a model acquisition program. And, um, and, and it is. Look, it, it, we learned a lot from the F-35. Um, we learned a lot from the F-22. A lot of those lessons were hard lessons, and we learned what we could do better with the uh, with the creation of the of, of the B twenty one. And I, the program managers, the folks that have been working on it, this has been a, a marvelous example of American ingenuity, and uh, a case of where when the when the Pentagon and the Air Force allows those professionals to get in, they know what their challenge is, and they stay the course and not try to make a bomber into something besides a bomber to begin with, things work. And that's what you see with the B-21. It is focused on being a bomber, but with that comes the ability to do lots of other things that have been built in from the very start. Senator, thank you so much. Um, we really benefit from your leadership, um, not just on the B-21, but on your understanding and your, your ability to see the value of US leadership in the world and what that provides. This country, our allies and our posterity, I see that you have 10 grandchildren. Um, so I know that you, it is important to you and for the future of this country. 10, and, 10 grandkids and a whisper. Oh. <laughs> Thank you so much, Senator. Thank you all for being with us. Would you please join me in thanking the Senator for his time? Thank you.